Always a pleasure to have you on. I am Pius Kojo Baka. Straight to our very first story. Government is taking some aggressive measures to check the contracting of new loans and servicing existing debts. It is therefore working to digitize the entire debt processes for all ministries, departments and agencies in the country as part of measures to control the rising expenditure. George Yafe has the rest of the story. The program seeks to integrate all the state institutions involved in the process of contracting and servicing of public debt by digitizing the debts of all these state institutions and agencies. According to government, it is doing this to increase the pace of debt service processing, improve the accuracy of debt recording and accounting. He believes that this will help to reduce the errors and improve what it calls debt transparency among all these state institutions. The government believes that it will also promote greater efficiency in the public debt management space. This proposal was captured in government's economic program that it has submitted to the IMF as part of initiatives to turn around the economy. Ghana has already been classified as a debt distressed country. This was after the IMF and the World Bank concluded work on Ghana's debt sustainability analysis. Ghana is also working to place limit on how much an administration can borrow, a move that can be linked to the debt ceiling program in the USA. Meanwhile, the government is taking some extra measures to limit the amount of debt that can be incurred by any administration. It has therefore proposed a debt target as part of fiscal reforms under the IMF program. Here is more. Government in its economic document, the IMF, which has been approved as part of the fund program, is proposing what it calls the debt target. This is part of a broad mechanism to promote fiscal discipline. Government in the document argues that the current laws on how we raise revenue and spend monies will be strengthened with this limit. The debt target will look to control extra budget spending and focus on what it describes the single operational rule. Managers of the economy in the document maintain that they will get the required legal backing for this action by amending the Fiscal Responsibility Act with this debt target initiative. The move, government believes, could prevent the situation where the country's debt might rate on sustainable levels and lead to another debt restructuring program. Government in the document is also proposing to reform the existing Fiscal Advisory Council, which will help play a more active role in assessing the realism of macro-fiscal projections ahead of the budget approval. There are also plans to ensure that all ministries, departments and agencies do their financial reporting and expenditure through the gift mix program. The move will help track expenditure of all these institutions. Government is also assuring to publish all fiscal strategy and risk in line with the public financial management regulations. Let's expand this uh, discussion further. We are joined by um, a former finance minister, Seth Tekpe, as well as economist, Dr. Patrick Esume, to discuss this. Pleasure you could join me, gentlemen, on Business Life. Let me start off with you, Mr. Tekpe. Now, I want to find this from you. How did we get here, and really, is this feasible? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, where we got, I would say that, what lessons did we learn in the past? We are a country that declared HIPIC if you remember, and then we continued to accelerate our borrowing through various administrations. And then we came down to the last you know, administration before this one mm -hmm. and proposed some debt you know, policy measures, uh, including the setting up of a sinking fund. Because when you predicate your debt on the primary balance, the definition of the primary balance is your expenditure excluding interest, mm. you know, um, less your revenue minus uh, expenditure excluding interest. What we have always missed is the amortization. It doesn't include principal, you know, and so by establishing the second fund, which is in the constitution, we sought, you know, to be able to cover both interest and principal, mm. you know, as a criteria, sustainable in terms of sustainability. Uh, now the figures I'm hearing of 55 and 65 percent range is actually the B plus ratings where we started to slip. So we were 
Mm. You know, coming back then, and you know that we ended at 57, you know, percent on the new basis. On the old basis, it was, you know, around 70 percent. Mm. And so the alarm bells were there, and various, you know, measures were being, you know, taken. But uh, to, the, to the question of the law and changing the law, we have a whole section of the uh, Public Financial Management Act, and you can refer to it. That is section seven mm. or eight, sorry, section eight or nine, devoted. In fact, uh, that is chapter, or yeah, sorry, chapter seven or eight from section 54 to 78 is devoted to only debt management. <laughs> you know, and so, for example, let me read just a few. The functions of a debt management office, which was to be established under this law, was never established. And then it regulates government borrowing and debt management approval by parliament, which reflects the constitution, the purpose for borrowing. But if I may go down, you were talking about state-owned enterprises. They are covered. Mm. Borrowing by, by local governments, that is section 74, reporting requirements of local government authorities, borrowing by public corporations and state-owned enterprises is there, reporting requirements by public corporations and state-owned enterprises is there, uh, power to appoint agents. We do have in the, the status of government debt, you know, in fact, the types of debt, debt, debt management strategy to be submitted to cabinet, annual borrowing and recovery plan, recovery plan, mm. which is what we are talking about now, issuance of government debt securities in the domestic debt market. Remember when we moved the bonds to the stock exchange and there are regulations regarding this. So I do not know, you know, apart from the, the you know, uh, quantification of a floor and a ceiling, which is normally uh, when you want to go quantitative, which is being proposed. But we know that already, that if we want to be in the B plus, B minus range, then we must be borrowing between 65% and 55% and 55%, mm -hmm. which is the goal we had set for ourselves. So I'm afraid it is more about enforcement. You know, we set up structures which will take money, oil money, you know, from the PRNA, that's also covered, you know, into the sinking fund for purposes of debt management. We know today is depleted, and yet we keep increasing. We know that we use part of that money to take off the first sovereign bond. Mm. So maybe as we continue, uh, we would, I would like to know from the government, you know, document, if it is a memorandum of economic policy, uh, financial policy, economic and financial policy, I'm afraid, I'm saying that we do have the provisions. They're already in the fiscal, you know, Public Financial Management Act, which was passed in 2016, Act 921. And in fact, the Budget Responsibility Act, which you mentioned, is actually an extract from the financial, you know, from the, what we call the uh, PFME, you know, so, mm. uh, yes, there is a need for tightening. There's a need for tightening the rules. Uh, but not just, and let me just end on this note so that I can pause. Mm. It's not just about debt. You know, as I said, your debt is, is from borrowing, and the borrowing is from your deficit. And your deficit is from revenue minus expenditure. And this is the purpose of the Public Financial Management Act to cover all this, you know, in one law, which you know amended you know, the, uh, the, F, the FAA, Financial Administration Act. All right. So uh, what we need is a comprehensive, you know, approach to managing our fiscal, including a, a particularly expenditure, so that we don't incur high deficits, which we have, 5%, and we've studied it. We are, today we have uh, <laughs> between 10 and 13%. Mm. You know, so the quantification per se, you know, is not a solution.
The okay. provisions are there. It is about the enforcement. Enforcement. All right. So, uh, Mr. Sumin, let, let me also pick your thoughts on this. And the IMF disclosed in its staff report that Ghana is expected um, to reach a moderate risk of debt distress by uh, 2028. Now, it pointed out that the bulk of the domestic debt restructuring process has, however, been completed. Are you confident about the projections the IMF is making? Good evening. And good evening to listeners and also Mr. Sektepe. So, I think, well, you know, it seems a little bit uh, optimistic. Mm. I mean, if you look at the time frame, you would think that, well, 2028 20, is sufficient time, but my worry is, um, you know, we have a, an election sitting in the middle of the IMF program. And you get the sense that, as we do with previous elections, maybe when the elections come, we will probably revert to type and, uh, you know, let our guards down and then we, we have to fight again. Mm -hmm. But a big chunk also depends on how much leverage you get after we finish with the, the discussion that we are having with our foreign debtors. So we don't, you know, yes, they've given us the financing assurances. But we really don't have the detail of exactly, I mean, how much we will actually get when the discussions are done, how much room that will give us, whether there will be any levels of debt forgiveness, or what exactly the specific details are. So I think at the moment, it's a little bit difficult to pinpoint exactly, you know, what, 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 what is likely to happen. If you look at what we've put on paper and the measures that we have, you, you will be you know, you'd be inclined to think that maybe it's possible, but, you know, we've been here before, we've been in an IMF program before, and especially the last one, we hesitated without achieving a lot of the things that we had agreed that we would achieve. So, mm. at the moment, it's, it's a little bit of hit and miss. All right. Uh, Dr. Suman, last week, the president indicated that um, basically at Quata um, uh, Economic Forum, where uh, he says that the IMF program would allow the government to tap international debt markets. And there are certain people who feel it is too early to consider returning to the capital markets. Now, your thoughts? Yeah, I was quite surprised to hear discussions about returning to the capital markets. I mean... So first of all, the document will not allow the document we sign on to until we exit the program. I don't think we are going to take we are allowed to take any more commercial loans. Mm. So if by you know going back to the capital market we mean going back and then borrowing as we've been doing in the past, then that's that's just not going to happen. But frankly, we have bigger problems to worry about than thinking about returning to the capital market to borrow. We have the economy has real problems. Mm. We have you know growth has slowed down, you know, and even when we are growing, we are not collecting enough revenues, and the expenditure has been out of control for some time, and we struggle to get hold of that. And then the structure of the economy is fundamentally weak that we need to, we need to think about. So really, any, any thought that, you know, we are just going to leverage this program and then go back to the international capital market, is completely out of place for me. Mm. Mr. Tepe, let me bring you in um, at this point. And again, let's refer to the president once more, because last night, uh, Sunday night, um, he did indicate that the IMF program indeed is not the solution to our economic woes. Now, um, do you believe that indeed um, that is it? But there is a need for us to have buffer to, you know, um, show up um, our reserves. Don't you think so? We need several buffers, mm. um, and we have been building buffers, which we have been depleting at very fast pace. The stabilization fund is the first buffer, you recall. Again, it's a counter-cyclical, you know, too. And so you recall that when COVID hit, the first funds we actually took was the 250 million, which we went to parliament, you know, to, to take. Uh, but with two efforts, we never actually restore those buffers. Uh, the second buffer, as I, was, I said a moment ago, was the second fund, and I don't want to be repeating myself, but we had been able to build a second fund, which we used 550 million US dollars of our own money, you know, to take off 
you know, the first sovereign bond, you know, of which we were just paying interest. We were not, you know, putting anything aside. But within a matter of three years of setting up the sinking fund, we were able to accumulate 550 million US dollars. So we refinanced out of the 750, 200 million with the World Bank, you know, facility, you know, and then, you know, we used the 550. And indeed, the current administration used 200 of the 550 to pay off the balance of that bond, you know, in, uh, on October 4th, 2017. After, you know, barely a year into coming into office. Mm. That is another significant buffer. We had another buffer which we created. The PRME is full of buffers. <laughs> you know, the contingency fund, which is mandated by the Constitution. We never respected this. And so I'm gratified, you know, to see that, you know, we are going back to talking about, you know, buffers. Yes, they are very important. If you listen carefully or read uh, the debt debate in the u.s you see that one of the compromises you know that they are reaching or about to reach is to take the balance of the buffer that they built for COVID to reduce the debt levels yes that's u.s they built over three trillion u.s dollars of buffer mm. for the next crisis after the global financial crisis we we're belittling the global financial crisis right <laughs> and saying that it comes nowhere near you know, COVID. Yes, but it is still a counter-cyclical tool which we need. So we had built in our laws these buffers, which were ignored. The uh, uh, PIAC, you know, kept mentioning uh, mm. this risk. Today, if we are hit by another crisis, we don't have any more buffer. So, I, I, yes, again, I welcome, you know, um, the need for us to build buffers. And the word buffers is used a lot with respect to the financial sector. Mm. But to the extent that, you know, the depletion of both domestic and foreign reserves at the central bank to the tune of 44 million, and earlier I remember the 10, you know, uh, billion, you know, Ghana cities that was used by Bank of Ghana, now 44 billion. Remember, they went to support the budget. Mm you know, as the document tells us. So the problem is the fiscal. All right. And if we are adamant that we are not going to be reviewing, all that is in the act is a strategy to look at, you know, the flagship policies. There's nothing firm that says that we are going to tackle it by A, B, C, and D. You can look at the prior actions and you can look at, you know, the, uh, uh, the conditions that have been set. There's nothing said, all you right. know, about flagship, you know. So expenditure is just there. So... Yes, we need we need buffers, but right. we need to look at a whole range of the fiscal. Sure, thank you. Uh, the president is right. The purpose of IMF policy is not it's austerity. It's a correction. It's okay. not to stabilize the economy. You have to do that for yourself. That's great. Thank you very much, um, Seth Tepe, for your time here on Business Live. Um, same as Dr. Patrick Isumin for your time as well on Business Live, sharing your perspective with us. We are indeed grateful, both of you. Hello, welcome back. The Ghana Revenue Authority Enforcement Team has picked up six owners of some provision shops and supermarkets over some VAT infractions. According to the authority, this new enforcement exercise is a follow-up to the test purchase conducted by some officials, which indicates that these shops are violating the VAT laws. So far, more than 10 shop owners are facing prosecution over similar infractions. There is more in this report. Today's enforcement exercise focused on shops that failed to issue VAT receipts to customers after the Ghana Revenue Authority conducted some test purchases. This has been a challenge for the revenue collecting agency in mobilizing the necessary funds to support government's initiatives. The enforcement unit arrested six shop owners and supermarket operators and handed them over to the Police Criminal Investigations Department. Here is Head of Enforcement Unit at the GRA, Joseph Annan. Like I said before, we started this exercise at the middle of April. And what we did was to go out there and test that space to know whether on our blind side they would do the right thing. So what we normally call the mystery shop shopping or test purchase. We send our officers out there to buy. And then once you fail to issue an invoice, which is approved by the Commissioner General, then you've gone against the law, Section 41 of the VAT Act, which mandates all taxpayers 
to issue the VAT invoice at all times or an approved invoice by the Commissioner General at all times. Once you fail to do that, then obviously you've gone against the law and for that reason, you'll be arrested by Gnari through the CID who is seconded to Gnari and then they'll continue with the process. Yes. Mr. Anand has also been speaking about the form of prosecution to be meted out to the culprits. Uh, these taxpayers have been arrested. Uh, the CID has taken over. He's taking them to the charge office for their statements to be taken. And then later they will come to our office for the pre-assessment, uh, preemptive assessment to be established, which they will pay immediately. And then CID will continue with their, their, their uh, you know, investigations and they will build up a docket for uh, the, our uh, legal unit to continue with the process. The operation will continue until all businesses comply with the VAT law. Moving on to some other stories, the head of the support to the private and financial sectors program at GIZ, Christian Jan, says it is important to invest in the building um, of capacity of young entrepreneurs who he describes as the backbone of Ghana's economy. Are speaking at the handing over ceremony of business startup tools to over 400 young entrepreneurs in Sunyani after skills training in partnership with the Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations, Mr. Jan urged the youth to improve their lives by investing in themselves. Bono Region um, correspondent Precious Semevo has more. German Development Corporation, GIZ, through its support to the private and financial sectors program, has presented business startup tools worth over 1 million cities to 420 young entrepreneurs from the Bono, Bono East and Ahafo regions at a ceremony in Sunyai. The items include computerized sewing machines, motor spraying machines, soap making, and cutting machines for beneficiaries who participated in the business idea competition and the Ejumaye short-term skills training to empower and help grow their businesses. Joshua Hiaba is the GIZ's regional advisor to the program. There was a basic challenge where the young people had challenged uh, with access to finance to start their own business. So we decided to um, come up with innovative financing models which will be best practices for others to follow. And one of such was to organize a business idea competition. The other program was the short-term skills training, which was part of a special project we call the Bono Project. And these are all efforts to promote self-employment, job creation, and youth empowerment. The head of the PFS program at GIZ, Christian Yan, in his address underscored the importance of investing in the people who are the backbone of Ghana's economy. All of you are the backbone of this country and the country's economy. It is for this reason that we find it very important to invest in building the capacity of young entrepreneurs so that you can start your businesses and expand further to create jobs and employ more people. In Thanks so much for being part of the bulletin. I am Pius Kojo Baka. There is always business stories when you log on to myjoyonline.com forward slash business. Do enjoy the rest of our programs. Bye-bye.